How do we value one year? Ask a student who's failed a grade. How do we value one month? Ask a mother whose baby has arrived prematurely. How do we value a week? Editors of weekly newspapers know the pressure of a deadline. How do we value one hour? Ask someone who lies terminally ill, waiting for a loved one who is late. How do we value a minute? Ask a guy who misses a train, or a bus, or a plane, or a cruise ship. How do we value a second? Ask an Olympic medalist, someone who has just missed having an accident, or someone saying goodbye to a loved one they'll never see again. Time is precious. I had a wonderful conversation with Carlos at the beginning of the week this last week, just kind of chatting him chatting with him about things, and he needed a little tech support, so I gave him that. And then he asked me what time it was where I was, and I told him, and he goes, oh, that's right, I forgot about the time difference. I'm in the future. <laughs> and he said it like that, too. It was great. We are not always aware of time. The, not only the importance of it, but what's happening as it is passing. We are all time travelers. We're heading into the future at the rate of one second per second. That's us. So when Jesus speaks to his followers and they're asking him about times and dates and important things that are going to happen, he tries to communicate what, instead of focusing on the time, on what our response should be as we are awaiting for these events to happen. And I think as he closes uh, this discussion about the end of Jerusalem and the fall of it and how that's going to happen and nobody knows the day or the hour, I think there are some very helpful things for us to consider. What are we going to do? How are we using the meantime? The time that we're waiting, that we're trapped in until God finally says, everybody out of the pool. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, we'll look at the very last section. We'll look at 45 through the end of the chapter. Matthew chapter 24, it's on page 1539 in your pew Bible. How are we using the meantime? Let's look at verses 45, 46, and 47. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their, proper, their food at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. Let's just stop right there. How are we using the meantime? Some of us are choosing to serve. And that's obviously something Jesus lifts up as a, as a good example for us to do, to, to be choosing to serve. He, he asks his disciples to consider who is the one who is faithful and wise. Now, he could have easily said, all right, this is how the end of the Jerusalem is going to call. This is the, the end of the Jewish world functionally. The temple has... It's never been rebuilt up, up to this time. Doesn't look like it's going to be rebuilt anytime soon. It was the end of the world as they knew it. And he doesn't say, this is how you specifically, disciples, are to act. He asks the question, who is going to be faithful and wise? And so therefore, I don't think this is just about the disciples who are sitting there listening to him. I don't think this is just about the apostles. In fact, uh, there are some who would say, well, since it's talking about people who are serving others, then maybe this only refers to ministers. I still don't think that's quite broad enough. 
I think this might actually include everyone. And here's why. Let's look at verse 46 in detail. It would be good for that servant whose master finds him so finds him doing so when he returns. It'll be good for that servant. The, the way the Greek is phrased, it's like that for, for whichever servant is doing that. And frankly, as congregationalists, we might read into this a little bit. Because each of us is answerable to Jesus alone. I had a nice little conversation at the end of the service last week. So what is different about this church than like the assembly church or the baptist church or what makes this church different well we're congregationalists and a central tenet of how we understand our faith is that each one of us answers to jesus directly ephesians 1 ephesians 5 colossians 1 colossians 2 we answer to jesus christ is the head of the church i am not the head of the church Whenever I get phone calls, every once in a while, <laughs> I love this one, Google will call me. You know, Google. Google will call me, someone from them. And yeah, yes, we're looking for the person who's um, in charge of the church. Well, that would be Jesus. Okay, we're looking for the person who's in charge of your local business. Well, that would be Jesus. And you can talk to him anytime. You don't have to call me. I'm just the guy who does the Bible stuff. I'm, I'm not in charge here. Jesus is in charge. And each one of us, as a, a part of a congregation, we, we, we all have the same. We, we are all the same. There is no ecclesiastical hierarchy coming down from on high. None of that's just not part of who we are. We, we technically, the National Association of Congregationalist Christian Churches, we have a home office in Wisconsin. I've never been there. I've never seen it. But they never issue edicts. This, these are the kinds of things you must preach. You, these are the things you can't talk about. No, it's nothing like that. In fact, what our home office tends to be is a, a central hub where... All of the local churches who are interested will send in information. Well, this is what we're doing as a congregation. And they read that all and they disseminate it to everybody else. So I get little digests that tell us, you know, our sister churches all over the country are, are serving Jesus. That's a huge shot in the arm for me. Because, frankly, we're a little church. Kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Not a whole lot of people accidentally show up in Warden. You have to want to come to Warden. It's no one here. This is an on-purpose place, which is actually kind of cool. But if I try to explain to somebody, I'm from Warden, and you're from where? Washington, yes. Desert, where? Okay. Middle of Washington, I, and I kind of explain what the area is around. And then even then, you have to be going on a main road, and then you're going to head south, probably heading to another city, and you're going to drive. You, you won't even drive past our city. You're going to drive past a sign that says your city is farther down the road that way. Nobody gets here by accident. The truth of the matter is, nobody gets into the kingdom of faith by accident either. God draws us, every one of us, we all serve. So frankly, I think Jesus' words here apply to all of us because we're all supposed to be serving. Jesus wants us, you, me, to be faithful and wise. Verse 47, this is really less about a reward and more about a responsibility. The master is going to give us more to be faithful and wise with. Verse 47, he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. This is not a, woohoo, I've, I've received all of this stuff. We're more like an executor of a will. It's our job to make sure that the resources that come through our hands get applied where they need to be applied. And maybe the resources aren't the physical resources. Maybe this isn't money. Maybe this is kindness or compassion. Our reward isn't what we get to be in charge of. But our increased responsibility means that we have an increased 
intimate relationship with the master. Our reward is Christ himself. So we choose to serve. But frankly, we know the truth of this. Not everyone does choose to serve. Or if they do so, they do so with maybe not the best motives. Let's pick it up from verse 48 and finish the chapter. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, My master is staying away a long time. And then he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. How are we using the meantime? Some of us are choosing to serve and some of us are losing our nerve. Some of us are losing our nerve. It's not always easy to be a servant. In fact, when we read in verse 48, he says, suppose that servant is wicked. I looked up that word and I expected to, to kind of see the word evil. Um, I think King James might even re refer to that, that word as evil. But the word doesn't mean evil. In fact, it, it doesn't even really mean wicked per se. It means worthless. It means, look, you've got one job and you don't do that job. It would be like, okay, we're, we're coming up on football season. It would be like somebody who's hired as the kicker. And every time they run and approach the ball, they miss. It's not like the kicker does kind, you know, anything else on the team. That's kind of his thing. And if the kicker doesn't kick, he's worthless. In fact, these days, if the kicker doesn't kick at a high enough percentage rate to be considered a worthwhile kicker, they trade him. This servant isn't wicked. He's so much as wicked as he's just not serving. A servant who doesn't serve, it, is a servant who doesn't serve a servant? Instead of caring, he's clock watching. And look what happens to him, verse 49. He begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with drunkards. Uh, this person has been placed into a position of authority by their master, and he uses that authority to feed his own wants and desires. We got to watch out for those who are wielding authority as a weapon instead of the tool to take care of their master's estate. Now, frankly, all of you are different. God has placed in you the, the tools, the, the abilities, the personality that you have, and you can affect people that I will never be able to affect, frankly, that I may never meet. Same thing with me. God has specifically crafted me to be me, and I connect with people that, frankly, a lot of clergy don't bother to talk to. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that we could walk around with God in them, Ephesians 2.10. Here's the concern, verse 50. The master of that servant will come on a day when he doesn't expect him and at an hour that he's not aware of. The concern is, in the back of the mind, that servant knows the master is going to return someday. But, oh, I'm sure it's not going to be today. I'm sure it's not going to be now. Oh, I'm sure, I've got lots and lots of time. We don't know that. It's reasonable for us to assume that in a perfect world, barring any major difficult, we might live to 100 years old. 100 and, 104 royal. I think I probably visited royal the month before he passed away and shook his hand, and it's my hand still, you know, hurt. That grip of iron that guy had at 104. 
So, yeah, that'd be great if we're going to live for that long. But see, the thing is, we don't know, we don't have a guarantee that things are always going to work out perfectly. We live in a universe that is broken. It is winding down. Whenever I tell Jamie that I have a project that I want to accomplish, you know, I try to give her what I think is going to be, and I think it's going to take a half an hour. And she automatically, oh, so it'll be four hours. No, and I, I used to get really offended at that. No, it's half an hour. Well, see, the thing is, when I make that estimate, I'm making the estimate under the assumption that everything is going to go exactly right. That I will be able to go to the hardware store once and get every part I need in the first trip. And that I have all of the tools I need to accomplish the job. I, I went to actually go fix Miss Vicky's car uh, this last week. And I looked up online, this is what you have to do, these are the tools you need. Oh, okay, I don't have a 17 millimeter wrench. <gasps> Yay, it's time to buy a new tool. That's always a good thing, you know. Great. So I go to the store and I get a 17 inch wrench and I said to the lady behind the counter, I, you're a very wonderful, beautiful young woman, but don't take this wrong. I don't want to see your face again today. I'm hopeful that this is the only thing I'm going to need to accomplish. And you know what happened? I could not find the bolt that the 17 millimeter thing was supposed to go on to. I have an appointment to take it into the shop. I can't, I, nope. I'm going to refer to someone with better knowledge and better tools. The servant knows the master is going to return someday, but doesn't know when. So, verse 51, he will cut him to pieces. The master will cut the servant to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I kind of, honestly, when I read that, I, that's a little harsh. Lord, here's something I want you to realize. This is from, I'm going to turn back a little bit. This is from Jeremiah 34, 18. I should have printed it out so I didn't have to stop and look it up, but I will look it up. Jeremiah 34, verse 18. This is talking about people who are entering into covenants. 34, 18. The men who have violated my covenant... And have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant made, they made before me. I will treat like the calf they cut in two and then walked between its pieces. A covenant is an agreement between a stronger party and a weaker party. And the stronger party would often make the weaker party go get an animal. Sometimes more than one animal depending on how important the covenant was. And they would sacrifice that animal. They'd cut it in two. And they'd place the animal, they'd make a little path, and there would be blood right down the middle of it. And the weaker party would be forced to walk in the blood right between those two pieces as a real solid way to remind them, if you break the covenant, this is what the stronger party can do to you. So when Jesus says that the master is going to cut him to pieces, what he's saying is there is a covenant relationship that exists between the master and the servant. Frankly, between you and your Lord. This is not Jesus threatening to cut you in half if you don't do what he wants. Not at all. But he wants us to realize the weight of the covenant that we, as his followers, as his servants, make with him. In our relationship with Jesus, we are not the stronger party. No way. Those who break the covenant are subject to being broken themselves. We as God's servants, after we enter into this covenant with him, we are to give our very lives to God. Frankly, if Carlos were here, I'd have him come up and give a testimony at this point. I'll give a short version of it. 
Carlos had been after me for ages to baptize him. And I wouldn't do it. And he'd get really frustrated. Why? And I would say to him, because you're not done running your own life. I'm not going to baptize anybody who's, who's an adult, who is aware of what's going on, unless they are willing to give their whole life over to Jesus and let him run the show. Well, he had one difficulty after another and finally came to the point. It's like, okay, I've been running my own life. This isn't working. I'll let Jesus run it. I said, now I'll baptize you. And right here, we as a church community witnessed his official surrender to Christ. That's how it works. We give our lives over to God. And we say, God, you get to call the shots. You are now master. This is a serious commitment. And the Lord expects us to honor our covenant with him. That we are going to be grafted into his life so that we would bear fruit. So choose to serve or lose our nerve. How are we going to spend our meantime? Let's pray. Lord God, we know that we have failed you over and over again. We know that everyone fails you over and over again. You use broken people because you don't have really have any other option. Everyone is broken. And so since that is the truth, I can take my brokenness and lay it on the altar along with everything else. Of course, I want to give you a wonderful, shiny, bright, perfect life. But frankly, Lord, I haven't figured out how to live that one yet. I'm living in the midst of a pretty broken life in a universe that is winding down. In the midst of so many circumstances that are out of control, I don't even know how many there are. I'm not required to. I'm not required to know how things are going to turn out. All I'm required to do is serve you in the meantime. To do my level best to point others to the open door. Hey, you know, there's a marriage supper of the Lamb. There's a buffet in there, and everybody's got access to it. All you've got to do is go in through the door. Lord, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for inviting us. Continue to shape us to be like Jesus. And then we will serve him in the meantime. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.